I was hoping you may be able to help. My research partner and me have a bit of a problem with a dogman at his cabin here in southeast Ohio. We have been researching the Ohio Grassman for about two years together. Well, now we have this dogman really becoming a problem. Since January 3rd of this year, this thing has been pissing on his cabin about four feet up in various spots. It has taken a frontal bite out one of his trees, it slashed one of them. It hangs out in the wee hours most nights growling all around his cabin. We have it on video, audio SND trail cam, so we know what we are dealing with. We are just asking for some advice on how to deal with it. This place where his cabin is, is a campground that is primarily closed for the winter. There are a handful of year-round residents, but a total of maybe eight. It is opening up for the season now, and we don't want anyone getting hurt. It is more of an upright dog than a wolf. He is getting more aggressive with time. My partner being an ex-army ranger does not scare easily, but this thing finally wore him out to the point he left his cabin and went back to his homestead to regroup. Our thinking at the moment is to try SND take it out. We started on a plan that we think will work, problem being we think there is more than one. They are grassmen all around this area, we have them on audio and photos, but neither is deterring the others. Any advice you have would be greatly appreciated. We don't really want to kill it, but it's getting to that point. We also don't want to draw attention to the area. The last thing we want is a bunch of people running around looking for it. Thanks for your time. My mother just told me that a few days ago, on her way to work at 5 a.m., she saw red eye shine in the corner of her eye from her headlights. She tried to look at what had caused it, but what she saw made her shiver. The creature was about my father's height, which is six feet or more, and it turned towards the cornfield after looking at my mother's vehicle from the side of the road. As she passed it, all she could see was the back end. She described it as a naked man with dark gray or black wolf-like hair with no tail. After she passed it, she kept watching it and saw it turn its head to look at her, but it did not turn its body, unlike how a Bigfoot would. Its body remained still. She said she saw incredible intelligence, but also felt an evil presence. A few months prior, on my way home from work at 11.30 p.m., I saw red eye shine, and then a large creature sped across the road about 3,000-4,000 yards in front of me. It had black fur, a long muzzle with a large head, broad shoulders with what seemed like a mane around it, large and long front and back legs at a strange angle, and no tail. When it happened, the first thing that came to my mind was an impossible mix between a wolf and a wild boar. At the time, I didn't know about the dogman, but after learning about it, that's what I believe that creature had to be. All of these incidents occurred in Morrow County, Ohio. Another sighting happened last week outside of Mount Vernon, Knox County, Ohio, about 35-45 miles from our house. I'm from a small Midwestern town. Nothing like what I saw happens here to my knowing and is pretty much completely normal. This took place in fall of my 7th grade, so around 2016-2017. Even though it was a few years ago, I know that I saw something, but I'm not 100% sure what I saw. By the way, I'm telling this in first person simply because it's easier. Kylie, my mom, called up the stairs. I quickly went towards her voice as she began to explain. Your dad and I are heading out for the night. She clipped in a gold earring. Do you mind walking the dog before we leave? I simply nodded in response, clipping in the dog's leash as she continued talking about what they were doing that night. It was late November night and the sun had already set. By the time my mom finished talking and the dog was clipped in and ready to go, I closed the front door and immediately felt chills not only from the temperature but the atmosphere. Not one person was out. It not that late, is it? I said to my dog with no response. I had made it half a street when my dog had stopped to sniff something on the ground. I looked out at the road ahead, nothing but houses and one stop sign. 
My brain immediately thought back to a dumb video my friend and I watched trying to scare ourselves in class. We're just like me someone walking looks up at a stop sign to see a woman staring back at them literally standing on the stop sign. I'm no one I say looking down from the bold red sign, I still couldn't shake a creepy feeling as I looked down the road. My heart stopped. I'll try my best to describe the horrifying sight I saw. Looking back at me was about an 8-9 feet tall shadowy figure. Something with two legs tall and skinny. Arms even longer reaching the ground but just as skinny. The body round completed with a long skinny neck and no face. Once again I say no face. I was purely terrified. I pulled my dog to run but she was frozen. I yelled out to her, making it hear then see me in the process. It began to follow us. In what I can only call a drunk on a tightrope walk. In response I ran with all my night. Cutting through my neighbor's backyard in the process, I slipped and fell all while running on the muddy grass. I turned around picking up my dog in one motion. It was even closer now. My head was pounding, as I ran with tears in my eyes. Turning around I fixed my grip on the dog and ran for my life. I opened my back door, throwing us inside. It's going to get me. I yell as my parents run to me. Thank God they hadn't left yet. Truly believing I was almost kidnapped, my dad ran outside. I sat for the next few minutes sobbing, trying to explain the events that just occurred to my mom. My Ada walked in through the back door and simply said there's no one. Ever since that day I've had terrible problems with anxiety and depression. To be fair it could have nothing to do with what I saw, but I have to think a small part of it was from the pure terror I saw that day. My name is of no importance, for I am a CIA operative and anonymity is my shield. Today I find myself compelled to share a true story, one that defies explanation and haunts my thoughts to this day. And so I have chosen to submit my account to your YouTube channel, hoping to find solace in the collective disbelief of others. So it all began when I was deployed to the war-torn African nation of Congo. My mission was clear infiltrate a terrorist organization and gather vital intelligence regarding their plans for a possible chemical attack on a major city. The gravity of the task at hand weighed heavily upon my shoulders, and the stakes were as high as they could be. As an agent of the CIA, I had witnessed my fair share of atrocities and the horrors of war. Africa was something else. It was a place consumed by chaos and despair, ravaged by years of conflict. Yet amidst the devastation, something else lurked, something far more inexplicable. One fateful night, while on patrol deep within the dense woods, a feeling of unease settled upon me. The darkness was impenetrable. Suddenly, as if emerging from the very shadows themselves, I saw it. A creature resembling something akin to a yeti stood before me. Its unkempt brown hair hung loosely, swaying in the slight breeze. Its eyes, a piercing yellow glow, fixated on me with an intensity that sent shivers down my spine. I watched in awe as it sniffed the air, its grotesque form devoid of a nose or mouth. It stood upright on two legs, a bipedal enigma that defied all logical explanation. Time stood still as I observed this inexplicable sight. But just as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature vanished into nearby woods. I was left standing there, heart pounding and mind racing to comprehend the impossible. The rational part of me insisted, it was a hallucination or a figment of my exhausted imagination, but deep down I knew what I had witnessed was real. Seeking answers, I approached the locals the following day, inquiring about any known wildlife that matched the description of the creature I had seen. To my bewilderment, they shook their heads in confusion. They told me there were no such animals in those parts. No wild creatures with brown hair and glowing yellow eyes. It was as if the creature existed only within the boundaries of my perception. Now as I sit here, sharing my account with you, I am plagued by a maelstrom of questions. What was that creature? Was it a mere anomaly, a result of my mind playing tricks on me? 
Or was it something more, something that lurked in the depths of the unexplored, waiting to be discovered? I was driving through northwestern Connecticut at around 12.15 this morning, just enjoying the quietness of the road. The night was dark, with only my headlights illuminating the path ahead. As I continued along the deserted road, something caught my attention in the distance. There, walking on the road, was a figure. It stood at an astonishing height of around eight feet, towering over everything around it. My curiosity peaked, and I couldn't help but wonder who or what it could be. I decided to turn on my high beams to get a better look. As the bright light flooded the area, the figure came into focus. It was completely black, almost as if it absorbed the light around it. The size of this being was remarkable, with a muscular and imposing build that sent shivers down my spine. It appeared to be humanoid in shape, but there was something unsettling about its presence. What happened next sent a chill down my spine. As soon as the figure noticed my high beams piercing through the darkness, it seemed to react. Its pace quickened, almost like a speed walk, as if it didn't want to be exposed to the light any longer. In a matter of seconds, it vanished into the nearby woods, blending seamlessly with the surrounding darkness. I was left stunned, my mind racing to comprehend what I had just witnessed. What was that creature? What was it doing out there on that desolate road in the dead of night? The questions swirled in my head, but I had no answers. I grew up a hardcore atheist and non-believer in the paranormal. Even the thought of E.T., life forms with technology capable of light speed travel seemed far-fetched and improbable. God seemed impossible, and if God did exist according to a scripture, I felt like he was a being without good morals. Around 2017, I became more of an agnostic who shattered his ideals of absolution, but still needed evidence for proof. I don't claim to know what could or could not be out there anymore. All I know is that the possibility remains. My father lives off Highway 44 between St. James and Cuba, Missouri. For several years, he has had strange events and sightings at his house and in his area. Going back to 2018, my father, my brother, and I were out at the barn late at night, roughly 10 p.m., doing work on my father's truck. We usually have some type of firearm nearby. As I was smoking a cigarette outside of the barn, I felt really uneasy. Nothing had happened out of the ordinary but I felt like I was being watched by someone having a scope on my forehead. The neighbors live about a quarter mile down the road on one side of my father's house, and on the other side is an open field. In front of the house is the road with the woods on the other side of the road, and behind the house is about four acres of land stretching all in a square that is mostly open with scattered trees, and the forest is the edge of the property. I felt like the threat was coming from the woods behind the house. I told my father and brother, but they felt fine. He told me that if I felt off to shoot several slugs in that direction. So I shot three slugs off into the woods. I didn't hear anything more, but the feeling persisted for about another 10 minutes or so. I figured I was psyching myself out and didn't think much of the situation. This happened near late summer or early fall, I believe. Nearly a year later in mid-July, I went back down there. This time my father instructed me to listen for a sound. It was nearly inaudible. It sounded like a heartbeat coming from the floor of his house. It was only possible to hear it if everything was dead silent and your head was near the floor. Nothing shook, but the sound was so consistent that it persisted at all times of the day and for over several months. I asked him if it was still happening when I left, and he would always tell me that it was, until about October, I believe. It was odd, to say the least, but it never made me feel unsafe. However, in September I went down there for a weekend, and had one of the scariest encounters of my life. I felt like a small child who wanted to cry for help. My father, my brother, their dog, and my cousin all went to town, so instead of sleeping on the couch, I went to sleep in my father's room. 
It was roughly 8-10 a.m. when I went to sleep on his king-sized memory foam mattress. I don't know how much time had passed when I fell back to sleep, but I was suddenly woke from my slumber when I felt the bed slightly moved. I figured the dog had jumped up, but I was so tired I didn't even open my eyes. Seconds later, the bed violently raised and slammed up and down for what seemed to be about 10-20 seconds. Scared out of my mind, I was paralyzed still. I didn't hear anything other than the bed slamming and the box fan being swept across the floor. As soon as it stopped, I opened my eyes and looked around the small room. There was a closet near the door that was closed and the door that was cracked open, which is not unusual. Afraid to move for nearly 20 minutes, I just sat there. I was hoping that nothing was in the closet. I grabbed the shotgun near the bed and opened up the closet, and it was empty. I then checked the rest of the house. Some open windows with the screen still in and both doors leading outside bolted locked. I proceeded to look online if an earthquake had happened. It didn't make sense because the box fan had been moved nearly five feet and was on the floor face down. My family returned after this incident about two hours later, and I kept silent because I forced myself to believe it was my imagination. Nearly two years later, in 2021, the unexplained phenomena started to happen on almost a weekly basis. My brother moved out, so the only two people who noticed it were me when I was down there and my father. He started off the conversation when I arrived there one Friday night with, I am not on drugs, but I need your eye to tell me if I'm going insane. Since I was more open-minded at this time, I agreed to listen and look at what he wanted to show me. It was nearly 11 p.m., and he instructed me towards his room to shut off his lights. What I saw was a silhouette humanoid figure that would almost leave tracers of itself as it would walk between two different trees in the backyard, from point A to point B. However, at point B, the figure would basically teleport back to point A and repeat the cycle. It also happened in my brother's room, except the figure would seemingly disappear and reappear behind multiple different trees, but still in a pattern. I honestly thought my father's eyes and my eyes were playing tricks on us and I was feeding off his delusions. That's until I saw a light flashing in the woods. It looked yellowish orange, but it flickered three times right at the house in three second intervals that would slowly fade down. He didn't see it at that time, nor did he tell me about it. But when I told him what I had just seen, it was as if I had just confirmed his fears. He said that he had also seen lights in the same area of the woods. We both covered our windows that night with blackout sheets and slept with a firearm next to our bed. I would also hear almost stomping sounds in the attic late at night almost any time I was down there for a two three day period. Too scared to check we just ignored it. I've also seen rusted metal illuminate green which is highly odd. For the first time, I saw the shadows before I convinced myself they were real. I coughed up multiple ideas as to what was causing them. Maybe it was the moon and the clouds. Nope, it was a new moon, and there was a single cloud in the sky. Maybe it was something like a bird, bat, bug flying around the pole lights. The pole lights don't reach the edge of the woods, and the silhouette was so dark it was as if some mass had to be right there. These are all my first-hand accounts. I have several other accounts I could add to these, but it could just be more of a coincidence than actual strange occurrences. I don't scare easily, nor do I usually believe in the supernatural, but I'm now a believer. I was fishing a lazy little river bend in southern Indiana one summer. I had ridden my motorcycle into the middle of nowhere, stopped to fish off of a little dirt road. A few hours later I had wandered up and down the bank a good ways. I end up getting pretty hung up in what appeared to be a decently deep area. After fighting the line for a bit, I decided to cut the line and my losses and call it a day. I took my knife and snipped the line. Started back up the bank towards the bike and noticed a glint of something shinning in the water. I got closer, waited for the current to clear up a bit, and could make out a car bumper. 
I got down in the water a bit and could make out an old 70s-ish sedan sitting almost nose up in the water. Extremely intrigued, I decided to come back in a few days when the water cleared up. We had just got a decent amount of rain, so cloudy water conditions. I come back a few days later. Water cleared up well, and since it flows for a while over limestone, it was mostly clear. I could make out several cars down in the water. Two old sedans and a pickup. They had been there for a very long time. Years at least. I called the local DNR to report it. They said they'd send someone out to take a look. I end up in the area a few months later and just swing by out of blind wonder and the deep hole was devoid of all cars. No telling what the hell the deal was. It did freak me out at first. Sorry for the rant. Lots of coffee this ohm. So just like that, something I couldn't see lifted the edge of my bed. I had my TV on a static channel, but had recently gotten in trouble for all my lights being on at night. I've always been afraid of what's in the dark, but my parents couldn't afford the light bill, so I knew I had to turn it off before I fell asleep. I finally got the guts to do so, and I nestle in under my covers to cower until I fall asleep. I'm drifting a little bit, happy nothing scared me that night, when all of a sudden the top right corner of my bed in relation to me lifts up a good foot and a half before falling back down, thumping me along with it. I adjust a mattress cause I like that sort of thing, just laying on the floor by the wall. They didn't lift at all, just the corner by my head. A holes. I jump up so fast and ran to the living room. I checked on all my siblings, checked to hear if my mom and dad were sleeping, and everyone in the house was. I woke my parents reluctantly, but I was sobbing. They told me I could sleep in the living room, but I got the creeps in there worse, so I just broke the rules and went to bed with the lights on. But literally to this day I am taken aback. The memory doesn't scare me, it's been a good 15 years, and I now threaten the things I can't see back like a crazy head, so they know I mean business, but it was so real. It happened, and I can't explain it from today's science. Had to be a ghosty or something. I am a logger in northern British Columbia, Canada. I am an avid hunter and have spent many a nights hunting alone. That being said, quite a few years ago, I was working on a broken down skitter in the dark after everyone on the logging block was gone, changing a blown hydraulic hose under the cab when I felt like I was being watched. The feeling continued to get worse and worse, so I was on edge and continued to work on replacing the blown hose. Every trip for tools to the service truck and back I would scan for eyes in the nearby tree line about 25 meters away with my flashlight. Nothing. Continue to work on the pain in the ass hose that you literally have to dive your head and upper body under the cab to reach. And so your legs are stuck up in the air and feeling vulnerable. The feeling of being watched gets more intense. All the hairs on my neck are standing and I hear a two-tone whistle from far away. Almost as if it was wind, it was so far away, but it was flat calm that day. Also, there was about six foot of fresh snow on the ground. I pushed myself out from under the skitter and looked around quietly with a flashlight for eyes in the tree line and down the road. Nothing. I had one side of the hose fitting to remove still, and it was the easier side and higher up, so I wasn't ass over tea kettle removing it. I put my head back under the cab and quickly began to spin the fitting loose. The feeling of being watched was so bad every hair on my body was standing, and then I hear the same two-tone whistle very loudly in the tree line directly behind me. I had the hose off at the exact same time, so I whipped myself out from under the cab and turned ready to thrown down with a one wrench in my hand, yelling, All right, where the F are ya? Nothing, no one there, no tracks, no eyes, no wind, nothing. The flashlight I had was more of a small floodlight for working on repair stuff, so it didn't light up inside the trees. The next day it had snowed another six or so, but I went and hiked the tree line with a 12 gauge and seven three slugs ready to go. 
No tracks that I could see, no perches on the trees where snow had been pushed off if it was a bird. Nothing. A couple of years ago, I used to work at a little coffee shop. I love that place, it was super chill. The kind of place all the real hipsters went to get coffee. Hipsters and old people. I usually worked afternoons and evenings, which weren't as busy as the morning, so oftentimes the manager would leave me to it, and I would be running the whole place by myself. One afternoon this lady came in, and to this day I have never seen a more bizarre looking person. I've moved to Austin, Texas since. You know the place famous for being weird. So trust me, this lady was really bizarre. Her hair was short and up in two knots, Miley Cyrus style. She was wearing a bright pink leather biker jacket, a long skirt and sunglasses that she never took off. You probably won't believe this next part, but I swear it's true. It sounds like I'm just trying to make it sound weirder, but this is what happened. She was pushing one of those toy strollers for little girls as baby dolls, and in it was her purse. Her purse was open because it was overfilled with bananas. She was pushing around a purse full of bananas in a toy stroller, so she walks up to the counter. Hey, what can I get for you? MMFPHHM, I'm sorry, what did you say? HHHHI coffee, uh, all right, a regular coffee, do you want creamer? She didn't even respond, so I assumed she didn't want any. She paid for her coffee, and then went into this hallway in the back that led into a somewhat secluded area from the rest of the seating. At this point, I'm thinking she must be really high on something, which would have explained the sunglasses. Anyway, business slows down eventually, and I take the opportunity to sweep up the floor a bit. When I come out from behind the counter, she's sitting in the back of that hallway next to the cleaning supplies closet, which she has opened. She has also set up a bunch of those cards you get from like Target or something around her table, so that no one can see what she's doing. I walk over to get the broom out of the closet, and as I walk past her I sneak a peek at what she was trying to hide on that table, because who wouldn't? She was burning incense sticks and mumbling to herself. I'm kind of scared to ask her to stop at this point, so I just leave her alone and get the broom and close the closet door. When I come back from sweeping the floor, she has opened the closet door again. I put the broom inside and close it again. So later it's closing time and she's still here. She's been sitting there burning incense, sticks, mumbling and opening that closet door for almost four hours. I yell out to let everyone know that we're closing and they all leave. I go out to pick up people's dishes and look back into the hallway. She's still sitting there. Hey, we're closing. I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. K. She doesn't move at all. I'm sure as hell not gonna walk over there and try to force her to leave because she's obviously totally insane, so I just decide that maybe she'll get up in a minute. I finish up most of my closing jobs, which takes about 15 minutes, and she is still there. Hey, you have to leave. K. At this point, she is creeping me the F out. It's just me and her alone in this restaurant at night. She's obviously a lunatic, and she won't leave. I walked back into the kitchen and just stood there clutching the biggest knife I could find. But then through the door that goes out to the counter, I saw her on her way to leave. She was walking very, very slowly. Suddenly, she stopped and stood still, just standing there doing nothing. She stood like that for five whole minutes. Then she proceeded walking as slowly as possible toward the door. It took her another five minutes to reach it. Once she did reach it, she noticed some newspapers and advertisements we have on a little counter next to it. She stared at them for a while, and then she took all of them, one at a time, and put them carefully in her stroller. This took her about another five minutes. While she was doing this, someone came from outside and opened the door to come in. She froze immediately, not moving a muscle, and stood there blocking the doorway. Eventually, the person carefully moved around her, and I told them we were closed, so they turned around and left. The lady did not move again until the person was gone. 
She then finally left and continued walking at the same incredibly slow pace on the sidewalk. She left a bunch of those advertisements and newspapers on the floor that I had to pick up. Weirdest thing that's ever happened to me. Several years ago, I suffered from a manic episode which led to squatting in a vacant home. Long story short, I was eventually picked up by the police and held for about a month until I was allowed to post bail. After I was processed and put into a cell, I became claustrophobic and began to panic. I began pounding on the plexiglass door and shouting into the intercom in my cell. Finally, they asked if I thought I was a harm to myself or others. Now, some people who have dealt with the mental health industry may know that this is the fundamental justification for what's called a 5150, a mandatory 72-hour hold at a mental hospital. I thought to myself that this could be my way of getting entrance to a mental hospital, so I told the person at the other end of the intercom that yes, I was a danger to myself or others. Unfortunately, that was not the case. Instead, they dragged me out of my cell, twisting my arm and leg, and put me in solitary confinement. They had me stripped of all clothing, not even underwear, and left me with two coarse green woven nylon blankets, one with Velcro to attach to my body affectionately known as a turtle suit. The walls and floors were dirty and rubberized. In the middle of the floor was a brass ringed hole to use as a toilet. A camera stared at me from a corner in the ceiling. There was no bed or chair. The lights were on at all hours. Cold air poured in from a loud vent in the ceiling at all times, making it impossible to ever feel comfortably warm. In order to retain heat and feel comfortable against the floor, I'd use one of the blankets as a cushion to lie on, while the other I'd use to cover my body in a fetal position and block out the light. There was no intercom or plexiglass door now. Just a small window to barely see someone walk past my cell through a hallway that gave no illusion to the time of day or night. The only way to generally tell time was by when I'd be fed they'd drop the food directly in my hands through a small slot in the door three times a day. I'd have to finish what was in my hand before they'd give me more or let me drink from a pixie cup of water or carton of milk. They didn't tell me how long I would be there for. They wouldn't answer questions. The isolation and boredom would just cause me to find delusional justifications for why I was there. It must be some sort of test, right? Sometimes I'd bang on the door yelling for help, to be let out for water, or I'd curse at the deaf guards that would never answer me. Eventually, I found a sort of rhythm of sleeping or lying awake beneath my blanket between meals. Sometime on the third day, I had a moment where I finally let go. All of my fear and worry, anticipation and expectation to leave just left my mind and body. A warmth filled me. Nothing mattered in that moment, and I felt at peace. Then it was gone. It lasted less than a second. Afterwards, all I could do was think of that moment, try to find that place somewhere inside me again, while I lay on the ground in my little rubber refrigerator. It was the feeling of a miracle. There's no better way to describe it to feel happiness in such a place. I was confined for four days before they took me out for my first court appearance. As they escorted me through the hall and the exterior doors to the awaiting van, I got to see the blue sky and feel the warm summer air on my face. I immediately cried and thanked the guards. I can still feel the icy grip of fear clawing at my heart every time I think back to that ill-fated hunting trip in the cursed woods of Kentucky. It was a day that would forever haunt my dreams, a day when my faith in the known world was shattered and the boundaries of reality were pushed to their limits. The woods in Kentucky had always held a sinister reputation among hunters and locals. They spoke of strange happenings, eerie sounds, and an overwhelming sense of dread that seemed to permeate the very air. But for a group of seasoned hunters like us, stories of curses and ghost stories were nothing but campfire entertainment until that day. We were a group of five, including me, Jake, the unofficial leader of our little expedition, 
and my lifelong friends Mike, Tom, Sarah, and Mark. We had ventured deep into the heart of the supposedly cursed reserve, seeking the thrill of the hunt and hoping to prove that the legends were nothing more than superstitions. As the sun dipped below the thick canopy of trees, casting eerie shadows upon us, we decided to split into two groups, with each group pursuing different game deer and ducks. It was in that fateful decision that our nightmare began. My group consisted of Mike, Tom, and me. We ventured deeper into the woods, our rifles at the ready, scanning the surroundings for any sign of prey. The air was thick with tension, and an eerie silence hung around us. Then, as we entered a small clearing, something caught our attention. It was a presence, a feeling of being watched that sent shivers down my spine. I exchanged nervous glances with Mike and Tom, and we silently decided to investigate. Our eyes widened in horror as we saw it an unknown predator, a monstrous creature that defied all logic and explanation. It had to be at least nine feet tall, with shoulders as wide as four feet. Its stringy hair did little to conceal the bulging muscles beneath, which flexed with each movement. Its thighs were as round as tree trunks, and it had hardly a neck to speak of, with a head that tapered into a cone-like shape. Its long arms swung menacingly by its side. I would describe it as a half-gorilla and half-Neanderthal man-type animal, a grotesque amalgamation of the prehistoric and the otherworldly. We were paralyzed by fear, unable to comprehend the monstrous being before us. Our rifles were clenched tightly in trembling hands, ready to fire, but the creature seemed to sense our presence. Its head turned slowly in our direction, and its eyes, dark and soulless, met ours. Time stood still as a shiver of dread washed over us. In that heart-pounding moment, the creature began to run, its massive form moving gracefully on two legs. Panic overtook us and we opened fire, but our shots missed their mark as we fired blindly in sheer terror. The creature showed no signs of injury, and the deafening roar of the gunshots only seemed to fuel its relentless pursuit. In our desperation, we abandoned our rifles, the very tools of our trade, and ran for our lives. The woods, once familiar and inviting, had transformed into a labyrinth of shadows and horrors. We pushed through thick underbrush, our hearts pounding in our chests, our breaths ragged. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, we stumbled upon another group of hunters. Breathless and wild-eyed, we recounted our harrowing encounter with the unknown predator, but their skeptical expressions greeted our story. They dismissed our story as an overactive imagination or the stress of the hunt getting the better of us. But we knew what we had seen, what we had felt deep in our bones, a creature that defied all rational explanation, a nightmare lurking in the depths of those cursed woods. I'm 38 and an army veteran trying to work as a local carpenter in Maine, the state where I have almost always lived. I've had two encounters with a creature I will soon tell you about, one that occurred when I was a teenager, and actually one a couple years ago. The house I am currently living in is my father's since he now has multiple heart conditions and would have to live alone. I and my sister grew up in this house, which is in eastern Maine. Living here as a child always felt a little off as if something was not right in a way. It's hard to describe. The house is surrounded by woods on almost all sides and sits on a dead-end road with six or seven houses down the way. We own 70 acres of dense forest that are littered with a TV trails and walking trails. I've been out on these trails over a hundred times, probably just clearing them for neighbors who we let use them and just trying to maintain them. But every time I'm out there, I feel like I'm being stalked. In this area, I nor my father have ever seen a bear, wolf, or mountain lion, nothing really above the size of a bobcat. As a teen, I liked dressing up in military gear and going out to play war and games similar. Normally go out with my friends Sid and Marvin, two guys who lived down the road. Sid was an older dude around 18 who smoked and did average, tough guy stuff. Marv, who I still am friends with today, we even served together until he was discharged was more on my level. 
We were both pretty timid young guys who didn't really associate with most people and just enjoyed being out in the woods and chilling. Anyway, one day we had gone out around 3 p.m. on a chilly winter evening to go play as we did most days. We all grabbed our gear, which was stuff that Sid's dad, who was a Vietnam vet, had given him, and then Sid had shared with us. This included medical kits, an ammo box, grenade pouches, etc. He even gave Sid an old handgun without the magazine or ammunition, but Sid's dad still didn't allow him to take it out of the house. So after a while of walking down one of the paths, we come to one of our favorite spots, which is sort of like a clearing full of boulders and moss. At the time, it was covered in knee-deep snow. Normally, my mother would not have let us go out this far, but she wasn't there to say no since she was in New Hampshire for the holidays. We had been out there for quite a while throwing snowballs and pretending they were grenades and blasting at each other with our sticks. It was about 5 p.m. when we were starting to gather our stuff because it was beginning to get dark. As I'm scooping up my stuff, Marv talks in a confused and worrisome tone. Hey guys, what the hell is that thing? He draws our attention to a tall, completely black creature standing on two legs, its arms dangling by its sides and dragging through the snow. From our angle at 50 or 60 meters away, we couldn't see its face, but it was walking away from us. I remember a weird tightness in my chest after realizing that I had no idea what we were looking at. Then Sid yelled out, Hey, hairball. Then the creature stopped. My chest grew even tighter, and it felt like my body was frozen after I saw its abrupt stop. It slowly turned towards us. Its face had no facial features, but it looked to be plain flesh. No nose, eyes, or mouth. We were so frightened that none of us could talk. It stared at us for a couple minutes before one of us suggested the bright idea of leaving. We crept away as the sun was now really low, while one of us constantly looked back until we got out of sight. Then we bolted back to my house where we hid inside, collapsing onto the living room floor. We were silent for a moment before I broke out laughing. The others joined in. After a few seconds, Sid said, Okay, guys, but WTF did we just see? We tried rationalizing, but I think we all knew that we had seen something that didn't belong. The guys ended up staying the night at my place that night. We stayed up late drinking hot chocolate and every now and then stepping onto the front porch to see if it may have followed us. After a couple days, the creature mostly disappeared from our minds. We still got together and hung out having adventures in the woods. I never told my parents about this thing that we saw because they probably would have believed me and I didn't want to go through all the trouble of explaining it to them over and over. Neither did I tell my sister because she wouldn't care and I wouldn't receive any feedback, so it was pointless. We three also never really brought the creature up again. It was like an unspoken agreement. My second encounter transpired in roughly the same area about a mile or two from there three years ago. I had just been honorably discharged and been home with my father for no more than a month picking up odd jobs, mostly in auto and house repairs, both being skills I learned from my time overseas. It was a summer evening when I decided to head out on the trails and take a look around after all. I haven't been out there for ages and expected the trails to be overgrown. So I took with me some basic brush clearings equipment such as a hatchet, an old machete, and some other stuff and then set out. Sid had recently moved to Vermont and Marv had been medically discharged a while ago and left with a leg disability making it hard to walk. I would have asked him to join me if not for his disability. I had made it half a mile into the main path moving and cutting up the suspected limbs, branches, and overgrown grass as best as possible hoping to come back tomorrow with a weed whacker to do some more work. As I got deeper the feeling of being watched returned, the same feeling I got as a teenager when I was out there, and I began noticing that the dense growth was getting thinner and more and more limbs were smashed or pushed out of the way. As well, the tall grass and overgrowth were no longer in the way. In fact, the trail became almost cleared and looked like it used to. 
I was shocked that somebody cared enough to come out here and clear all this. But as I thought on it more, I remembered that the entrance hadn't been groomed. So how did they get in? I began looking closely at the ground, noticing feet or paw prints I had never seen before. I crouched down to gain a better look. The print had three pointy toes each about six inches long and were spaced about three feet apart in sets of two. I didn't recognize these and decided to just follow them a little further to check it out. About a quarter of a mile later, I see this creature. My second encounter, and so far my last time. It was walking from the side of the path at a slow pace, not acknowledging my presence. Not yet, at least. It slowly crossed the path and continued into the woods, and after a minute I walked up to the area where he had entered, and there it was strolling or creeping into the woods, still not noticing me. I could hear his arms dragging across the forest floor and his fur coat still looked silky black, yet I wanted to see its face again, but not to the point where I would risk being spotted. So I slowly reached for my phone only to realize that it was in the front pocket of my backpack, as I didn't want to lose it while working. I pulled the bag from my shoulders and placed it in front of me and began unzipping the pocket. But as I did, the creature stopped as he had done the last time. Oh Lord Jesus, I thought as I froze and my chest tightened. It began to turn. Its fleshy face began staring back at me. I tightened the grip on the hatchet I had in hand, and now that I think about it, that probably wouldn't have done much to the eight-foot behemoth, now that I think about it. We both stared motionless for what felt like hours. In reality, I had no idea how long we had been there. I eventually stood up with my legs feeling numb. I backed away until it was out of sight, and then took off as fast as I could go. As I was running, I was sure I heard a violent scream from behind me, but I wasn't going to turn to look. Long story short, I haven't been back in those woods for three years and don't plan on it either. I know this may sound over-exaggerated or fake like something from a children's book, but I know what I saw and Marvin knows what he saw. I will never forget this. I was living in a travel trailer for a time on my sister's property, about three acres or so, circa the summer of 2019. The house was in the front on half the property, and I was in the wildlands backfield behind the backyard. This was near Redding, California, and the Sacramento River, only several blocks away, basically in the country and county outside of town, but quite a few residences up and down the streets around the area on big lots. I don't remember what made me open the door and stick my head out to look around one late evening, but something caused me to do it. Maybe some noise. As I was looking around, I heard what sounded like several very slow footsteps in dry brush going crack, snap, crack, like someone was walking away slowly, kind of being stealthy. I then realized it was right there, about 15 feet away, maybe on this side of the sea through wire fence, but it could have been right on the other side of the neighbor's property back section. So I was looking, waiting to see some animal wildlife or something but there was nothing. It was dark, but I had my outside trailer light on, and there was some good moonlight. If there was something there, I should have been able to see it. Then I heard someone run off into the backfield. It had to be a very large, if not huge, heavy animal like a horse. It was bump, 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 bump. I was surprised it didn't shake the ground or trailer, but not a four-legged horse like Clippity-Clop. It was an obvious two-legged run, probably with a very long stride, and then it was gone. But I saw nothing like it was invisible. I went back in and locked my door and nothing else happened. I looked around the next day for some footprints, but didn't find any. I can only think that it must have been a Bigfoot. Is it possible that it was cloaked or invisible? Okay, so a few years ago, maybe like two or three, I was out walking out in the woods behind my grandmother's house, and I had a really bad feeling like I was being watched and heard something following behind me. 
Deer season was just about to start, so I thought nothing about it because I thought it might be a deer. Deer tend to hang out in the woods, so it wasn't much of a worry. I was about to head back through the trees and found a tree that I didn't feel particularly comfortable being near. As I had picked up bad vibes, but I was being stupid and I looked around the tree and it had like really big and strange claw marks in and on the bark of it. There was also some bones from what I'm guessing was a canine. When I had made it out of the woods, I had went inside the house I don't really remember how I got there and my grandmother and why I had been bleeding. Note that I always carry a knife on me, so I went into the bathroom to patch it up. That was the end of that interaction. Something of the same sort had happened a few months later when I was visiting my aunt. I had also decided to explore the woods near her place, and I had caught a glimpse of a really tall figure covered in fur I had taken out my photo to take a picture of it and zoomed in to get a better look at it, and noticed it was covered in leaves and a little bit of blood. It had very large antlers, so I went back to her house and researched about it. Both settings of the woods were both more so marshy, so I decided to just call the Windigo Marsh. So now I have a Windigo that lives out behind my grandparents' house. I had also wound up hearing a call and screaming when I was walking. My significant other and I used to manage a fly and fishing resort outpost in very far northwestern Ontario. We did this for a few years in the summers. We would live on an island from late April, early May until mid-October on a lake that had no road, rail access at all. There was also no phone service, no internet, no TV, no electric grid, no indoor plumbing, etc. This shit was as remote as it gets, and we'd live it for seven months out of our year. Now typically the planes that get people in and out of there are little Cessnas and 50-year-old de Havilland beavers and otters, cubs slash super cubs and the like. Very old, loud planes that you can hear coming miles away, fly low 5,000 feet typically, and don't fly past sundown. So this one night me and significant other are outside having before bed smoke and dog is out with us. We're alone this week on the lake as there's no guests on the lake at all, meaning there's no other humans for about 500 kilometers in any direction from us. It's about 12 a.m., pitch black, and suddenly we see this light come over the trees of our island. But something's off about it. It's not a shooting star or an airplane that's apparent. It moves weirdly, changes direction suddenly, changes altitude. It's almost scanning for something. It's also completely silent. As we watch it, we both have this feeling of dread and fear. The dog also begins to freak out, barking and hair standing up on end. At this point, we run inside and turn every light in our cabin off. We then watch as it continues onward over the lake. As it goes, it stops in intervals and adjusts its altitude. Up scans forward a few hundred feet. Down scans forward, up scans forward. Down scans forward. It does this until it's over the next tree line and out of sight. It took us another hour to fall asleep. We've never been believers, so to speak, in extraterrestrial life or unearthly UFOs, but that pretty much converted us on the spot because it was so scary we were shaking afterward. I'm just glad someone was with me because every time I write this it sounds crazy, but it happened. Thanks for listening yet another episode of Nightmare Hours. If you love our stories, do hit that subscribe button. Good night, folks, and see you tomorrow at the same time.